We've come to Hereford, which is near the Welsh border, to visit the factory of TaylorMade who make joists and trusses. We're always fascinated to see how things are made and more importantly, what you need to know when you're using them. So come with us and we're going to find the technical experts. So over here we've got our posi joists being put together. So Mark's over there putting the actual frames together minus the webs. They're going to be placed on by hand, uh, carefully located, and then our roller press here will come along and just press them home and then that's all good to go as you can see all nicely pressed in all fully fully fixed in if i put in a load on here what's happening to that where's it going so what happens here then is of course the tendency is that this wants to compress this wants to go downwards and this is where our triangulation comes in again so the load's going to come down here it's going to come back up here and ultimately it's going to come down to the support be that sitting on the block or in a hanger we always want to transfer our loads from anywhere on this joist back down to this point and that's where these webs are coming in so what have they missed these ones out then no not at all now the main purpose of these is as you can see from each end we've got the webs coming in and if we didn't have this here they'd have a bit of an argument in the middle there oh, okay. what it's also very handy for is services your ducts pipes that sort of thing yeah, absolutely that's why i love these because it saves a lot of drilling so this is the Hundegger Speed Cut 3. So it measures it, it works out what the lengths of timber it can get out of one, one piece. We tell it how long the piece is and it'll work out the rest. So inside there's a circular saw blade. That's right, yeah, it can move around multi-directionally to cut the angles and the you know notches. That's oh right, do that. Oh okay. Yeah, yeah. These are the lasers that project the parameters effectively the job. So we can see our plates on there. We can see exactly where the plates need to be. So we can line them up exactly perfectly and then they'll get pressed in. So where's that laser coming from then? It's coming from oh, up there. Yeah. There's our little laser projection boxes up there. So they'll get fed directly from upstairs. The information will get loaded up and then they shine down, yeah. Do you still want to know that once it's all together, you've, you've laid the timbers down, you have a little measure just to be on the safe side and then he fix everything securely with using the chocks. He's just laying out his timbers in preparation for using them to build each of the trusses when the jig's set. What would you say the typical pitch is then of most truss roofs? Uh, well, if, if such a thing exists, you're probably talking somewhere between 30 and 35, yeah. Um, for, for your standard set of fix, I would say. An attic truss, you might be very, uh, you know, somewhere towards 40 degrees, or maybe even higher if you can. So he's got a drawing there. He's working to the drawing, is he? Yeah, so on this particular occasion, um, he's actually putting it together the old-fashioned way, using the measurements uh, and, uh, and the drawings. So they're not worrying about the lasers? Not on everything. Generally, it's a good idea to use them. But on some jobs, um, if they've only got like the one truss anyway, and you've got to measure it to check it, well, you might as well just get on ahead and measure it as you're going. I want to talk to you about what is involved in a truss, because obviously you're using a lot less timber than you would in a normal cut roof. With a cut roof, then, what you'd generally be looking at is what we call singularly supported items. So there's a pair of rafters, each individual elements, the two rafters connecting to a typically a ridge beam or a steel, separate element which is the floor joist. All three individual elements now are going to be combined together in the truss. We can use the triangulation, as already mentioned, um, and what we're trying to achieve is to always take that load path back down to the wall plates, the wall plates being where we've got foundation and support for these trusses. Is a truss roof actually stronger than a cut roof? Yes, it can be, because you've got the uh, the extra braces. It saves on material, it can give you an extra strength, uh, they're easier to install, they're lighter. The more modern way of doing things, I think people do swear by a cut roof, but I don't think nowadays there's as many of those guys about. And the other thing that you do, of course, is joist. Joist, Posi joist, yep. I saw a test some years ago where they put a, an ordinary traditional joist, put a foot on, and to my amazement, the old solid timber broke long before yeah. the other one. It's which much is the same amazing. principle. So yeah. again, it's using the minimum amount of material, like in this case, top and bottom rails, and it's that triangulation again. It's the metal webs that are actually spreading that load and taking that load back, uh, back down to yeah. the wall plates again. Of course, you don't need any supporting walls in the middle. You can you can have a bigger span. That's, that that's right? right, yeah. They're capable of spanning further. And as you yeah. quite rightly say, without any additional supports where yeah. traditionally with a, a, a joist separate from the rafter, separate from the rafter, yeah. it would almost certainly need some additional support yeah. coming from underneath. Your name suggests that these are bespoke, tailor-made. You're doing them, you know, so you get a lot of self-build, you get a lot yeah. of smaller builders yeah. rather than the big house builders. You're yes. giving a 
bespoke service. So somebody gives you what a drawing of the building they want. Yes, yeah. okay, it could be some architectural drawings that have been pretty much done and, and building regs and all of that. Uh, it could be a phone call. You don't need a structural engineer then. I haven't got to give you structural engineer calcs for this, is that? If you've got a set uh, of drawings that an architect has done or a plan that you've done, we can use our system. They're our top designers. They know what they're doing and they can come up with something for you. If we can't do it in timber, we might advise you that you, you speak to a structural engineer, but generally we can tackle that in house for you. I noticed that a lot of your timber isn't treated. Is that a problem? Because I've always used treated timber. There is an area in the country where treatment is specifically required. That's where I live, um, the Longhorn um, Beetle. Yes, there's a very small area of the country where you do absolutely have to have it. You know, you, we, we advise customers that if you're not in that area, you don't need it. The joist hanger, if you're using the joist hanger, you, you can sit them on the in the skin. Yeah, yeah you, you can, can sit them on the block wall. and build the walls up between and, and carry on up, yeah. or you can sit them in hangers from the face, the inner yeah. face of the wall. Do they have to be packed? tight against the wall you don't want no. any the hangers don't want to have any gap at all between the face of the hanger and the face of the masonry um, generally good practice uh, would be six mil maximum of six mil from the face of the hanger to the edge of the joist oh, right. um, so and it you gives you a little that. bit of movement yeah oh. i mean a couple of two or three mil would be sensible because what you don't want to do is try and offer these things and then have to sit there and tap them in and i wouldn't have thought there'd be much uh, danger to the joist itself but you might you might just damage the end so no, good practice. Keep yourselves a couple of mils shy of the uh, of the hangers. Was that six mil overall? Or That's six mil at each end. Absolute, oh, okay. absolute maximum. If you measured it up, um, and uh, and give yourself sort of five ten mil okay, on there, that would so be perfect. If I've had my house built and the brickies haven't been that accurate, the choice I've got then is to phone you and say, can you make them a little bit shorter or longer or what? But the best thing to do in that case is we can apply uh, two different types of end. There's very much a standard end which has a 25 mil horn, we call it, that's top and bottom. Oh, no, yeah. You can trim that back. In fact, we can see it here. And that's why you have that overlap, so you're not just relying on that timber to do the job. You've got the timber and the metal work working in conjunction ah, there. To get okay, it so the metal is actually just sitting on yes, the block. that's work. right. So you, we spoke about the bracing. Is that wind bracing or is that just to get them upright? So wind bracing is not something that we do here. It's a separate engineered design oh, item. Oh, uh, a, a, typically a wind brace would actually sit underneath your trusses and connect all uh, along a certain bank of trusses and fix those to the wall. So that's wind bracing. Forget that. Stability bracing is what we use oh, okay. here. And that effectively fixes one truss to the next uh, in a transverse direction so that we know that the load that we're applying comes down our truss can't buckle one way or the other because it's been braced one truss oh, to the next okay. using generally standard 22 by 100 timbers what is a strong back strong back that goes through a posi joist so it's it's uh, it's bracing you always need it uh, you need it for joists uh, with an internal span of greater than four meters uh, and it's deemed at that point that any joist longer than that really wants to be connected to the joist next to it uh, to make it really one cohesive floor rather than a right. series of individual joists. One of the things I don't like about 600 centers is that it makes it a bit saggy and baggy. And So do you use noggins? It, it might be prudent on occasion to use a noggin to, to help um, transfer the load. Mm. Um, I think generally these days you wouldn't necessarily worry about it. What are the most common problems that you find? Probably understanding the stability bracing. bracing. So again, wind bracing is something that we would uh, yeah. we, we have done. Um, mm. Again, it's, it's very much with a, an input from an engineer. Um, there's certain ways that you need to brace certain types of member, be that a rafter, uh, an upright timber, or, or a, uh, a web that goes diagonally. There's a, a different sort of uh, methodology for each. The bracing might go along the trusses and fix to each truss horizontally, oh, okay. it might go diagonally, yeah. um, and it's just an understanding that the customers need to have to, to, to get that right. Do you give them a drawing with all that on or not? We have all of the information provided in the site pack. We like to keep it clear, and in the site pack will be all of the bracing information required. So if you want to find out more about tailor-made products and how you can use them, and more importantly, how you can buy them, follow the links on the screen. <laughs>